Hi. Uh, afternoon. I'm Sridhar Mandayam. I'm a nephrologist. I work in uh, Houston and I'm very actively involved in clinical trials. All right. Next to me is Saira Rodriguez. Saira is one of my study coordinators and we spend a lot of time taking care of patients with different kinds of kidney disease and uh, having them participate in clinical trials. I'd also like to introduce my dear friend Jamila. Jamila happens to Hi. be a physician assistant who also is one of my patients and a participant in one of our clinical trials. So it's wonderful to have the three of us together for this, uh, I guess, afternoon chat to talk about clinical trials and kidney disease. So uh, everybody good so far? Yes. Yes. Slightly, yes. slightly hungry, I guess, but other than that, <laughs> we're good to go. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about IGA and then we'll get to Jamila and Cyrus' experience. So for those of you that are unfortunate enough to have IgA nephropathy, I'm sure you know that it's uh, we are evolving our understanding of this kidney disease. Nowadays, it is considered as a autoimmune kidney disorder. And we believe that patients with IgA nephropathy, either for genetic reasons or environmental reasons, or a combination or two, make a slightly different kind of IgA. So IgA is one of the antibodies that our body makes, and it's normally there to protect us from external infections. But in patients with IgA nephropathy, their IgA is slightly different. It has an, a, an extra chain on one side, and that somehow triggers an immune system. The immune system makes antibody against the IgA, which then gets trapped in the kidneys, and patients have kidney disease. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, most patients with IgA nephropathy have very few symptoms. So they have to be really alert to what's happening to them. They need to have an alert physician, clinician, that can check their labs, check their urine, trigger an investigation to identify that they have IgA nephropathy. At this point, the way to diagnose IgA nephropathy is still with a kidney biopsy. But I am hoping that in the next five to 10 years, the science will change and we're able to diagnose IgA without a kidney biopsy, just with blood and urine tests. So I'm gonna to pivot to Jamila. Jamila, how did you find out your IgA? Tell us about your IgA nephropathy story. Okay, thanks, Dr. Mendayam. So I um, actually found out about my IgA nephropathy about seven months after giving birth to my first child, my only child. Um, I went to my PCP, my regular doctor, just for an annual checkup, and um, the urine results came back with blood and protein. So we repeated it. And the same thing, blood and protein in the urine. So then I went and I saw a urologist. They did a cystoscopy, which is a procedure where they put like a catheter in your urethra to make sure everything looks good in the bladder. Everything was normal. And so my next step was a nephrologist. And so that's how I um, kind of connected with Dr. Mendiam and uh, we did something called uh, urine um, creatinine protein or protein creatinine ratio. Um, and that needs to be 0.5 or under. And mine came back like 0.66. We repeated it again in a couple of months. It came back at 1.1. And then that's when we did the uh, kidney biopsy. And it was confirmed IgA nephropathy. So the time from protein and blood being found in my urine to the time of diagnosis of IgA nephropathy was about five months. That's how long it took. And I, I, I think that that's amazing because most of the patients that I see, it's usually years because you what happens is patients don't really have any symptoms. They have an abnormal blood test or a urine test, usually an abnormal urine test. They go to a urologist, the urologist doesn't find anything and they just dismiss it. And when mm -hmm. women, if they have blood or, or protein in the urine, is automatically assumed to be related to their menstrual cycle. Right. And so I think I commend you for making sure you got seen, for making sure that we did the biopsy and followed up. So that's wonderful. And this is a really nice segue to talk about the, the visionary trial, which is something we're here to discuss. So the visionary trial is testing the benefit of an antibody called cibeprinilimab which is a monoclonal antibody against something called April. 
So in, in Jamila and in patients like her that have IgA nephropathy, the current hypothesis is that they have overactivity of the cytokine called April. And what April is supposed to do is it's supposed to make your plasma cells, that's the cells in the body that synthesize IgA, it makes them work overactively. It somehow tweaks them to make an abnormal form of IgA. So there's a lot of evidence, especially in the phase one and the phase two studies, that when you give patients sibeprenlimab, they reduce the amount of abnormal IgA formation, which then leads to reduced protein in the urine and reduced kidney damage. So it's wonderful that Otsuka and several other companies are bringing clinical trials for, to patients like Jamila and others, where we can actually treat the reason why patients get IgA nephropathy, not just wait for damage, wait for protein and other things, but actually go to the root of the problem. Uh, I'm gonna uh, pivot to Saira now and ask her, Saira, if somebody needed to or wanted to participate in a clinical trial, what's the process? What do they have to do? Well, the first thing, if, if they're interested, is um, the first get to for a lot of our patients is to go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov um, and look at whatever research is out there for whatever disease, in this case, IgA. Um, and I would say, do your own research like Jamila did when we talked. She did her own research and she, when she came in, um, the first thing you do, we do is give you a consent. And it, the main thing is for you to understand that consent and what you're consenting to. Uh, the consent is there to explain what the trial is about, how it's going to be, uh, the procedures that are going to happen. And we don't deviate from that. So um, the main thing is to, to educate yourself about it. And then when you do find a site like Perlotto here and reach out to us and we can help you understand and, and hopefully find that right treatment for you. And yeah, I want to sort of butt in and say it isn't difficult to be in a trial. And I'm sure Jamila will tell us her clinical trial experience. And I hope it's how I feel it is. I think and strongly believe that every one of my patients deserves the ability to participate in a clinical trial because it gets them medicine sometimes three to five years before they're approved by the FDA, before they can be available in the general market. And we spend a lot of time and attention taking care of our clinical trial patients. So Jamila, I'm sure it was intimidating and scary, probably not as scary as the biopsy, but tell us about your trial experience. Yeah, so, you know, you get to a point, so with IgA nephropathy, there are really no symptoms. You really don't feel sick. You might have foamy urine and that's a result of protein in your urine, but you, you don't really notice that, right? But the two markers for IgA nephropathy is that GFR or how well your kidney is functioning. And then also the amount of protein that's in your urine. So if you are on, let's say, um, like lisinopril or a medication to treat IgA nephropathy and that's not enough, what is the next step? Usually um, prednisone or steroids in the past was the next step, but who wants to do that? You know, like who wants to deal with the side effects? And I didn't want to deal with the side effects. So I knew that I needed to do something. And the clinical trial was the next best answer. And actually, I thought I would enroll into a trial with a pill because a pill is much easier than an injection. But no, after I read the side effects, I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that one. <laughs> I'm going to go for the injection because it seems like there's a lot less side effects with this one. So yeah, whenever you roll, enroll into a clinical trial, just make sure you completely understand what you're signing up for, what the side effects are. If it's an open label trial, meaning you know that you're getting medication. Um, yeah. That's, that's actually wonderful. I think that inside I will also pitch in. Uh, so it's important for patients to understand the informed consent process. It's not just a box to be ticked. It's not just something that you sign. You really need to have a conversation with the clinical trial team so you really get to know what is expected of you. I'm not trying to scare anybody away from 
getting on a clinical trial, but it's really important for you to be able to know what you're signing up for and how it's going to impact your sort of the rest of, of the next few months to years to be on the trial. Um, you spoke about this, but maybe we can, when you had to make a choice on a trial, what mm-hmm. were the things that you paid attention to? And then Saira, when people come talk to you about clinical trials, what are the things that they care about? Okay. Um, go ahead, Jamila. <laughs> okay. So um, I definitely cared about side effect profile was number one for me. You know, um, I needed to make sure that if there were side effects that they would be very, very mild, like maybe just a little bit of pain at the injection site, but nothing like systemic, right? Um, The other thing that was important to me was the amount of time that it would take to be involved in a clinical trial. And so um, that's also important. with these clinical trials, there's also a stipend. So if you don't have transportation to get to the location or the site, there is reimbursement for that. Um, there is also reimbursement for your time. So so that those things are important. And then I've formed a bond with Syra. She's like yes. family now. And so <laughs> is Dr. Mandayam because they take such good care of me. And I, I think that that's one of the big advantages of participating. You get yourself a, a second A team that yeah. takes care of you, not just your regular primary nephrologist, but the clinical tri- trial team is always there. So Jamila spoke about her side of a clinical trial visit. Let's hear about Saira's side of how, how much time, energy, a clinical trial visit takes. <laughs> Well, I'm, I will tell everybody watching all the information that Jamila just said came from that consent that I talked about. All the consent explained to her the time that it would take, um, how many times she would have to come on site on clinic to receive treatment, um, the compensation for her time and travel. It's on the consent as well. So like I said, the main thing is my job is to help you understand that consent, what you're committing to. And even though you do sign a consent, if you do decide to join, you are in control of this. It's not me or Dr. Mandayam. The patient's always in control and they always have that, that if don't feel comfortable with anything that's happening, they can withdraw consent at any moment. So you're in control and that's the main thing. And like Jamila said, we, we, you formed that bond because we're seeing each other on a, on a a date, not a daily, but for her, um, every other week. And I mean, you just do bond, um, form that bond with that person and we get to see your labs more than your regular doctor and you have access to all of that free of charge um you have access to all the labs that are being um done so yeah there's a lot of benefits but i would say the first thing don't be afraid come to the site come see us come talk to us come have a feel of who dr mendiam is and who um or or any of your doctors right? right talk to your doctor and say i hear that there is a trial or is there a trial for my disease? Yes. And it may not just be IgA nephropathy, it could be anything. Is there a clinical trial out there? I'd like to find out more information. And they're yeah. supposed to give you the information and if they don't, you can be like Jamila, you can go on clinicaltrials.gov <laughs> and Google the various the trials and the diseases and you, you will find information out there. I mean, we've been, uh, I guess, giving high praise to clinical trials, which is because that's what we do for a living, but. What are the drawbacks? What is the biggest pain in the butt for Jamila about participating in a clinical trial? I think for me, initially, um, initially it was the time every other week, you know, but you get used to it. When you go in, um, the, the visits are different. So some visits require blood draw. And so those visits might be a little longer, might be a couple of hours, whereas some visits you just get the infusion and you're monitored for 15 minutes and then you can go. Um, another thing that I uh, worried about was, oh, this is new, you know, this is new. I'm kind of like the guinea pig, you know? <laughs> But again, it's all about your kidney function, right? What are you going to do to 
make sure your kidney function does not decline, okay? Because it's all about time. Your kidney function could be good today, but what will it be in the next two years, five years, 10 years? So it's important to, you know, take action now rather than when it's too late and your GFR, your kidney function is too low. But uh, let me piggyback on the guinea pig. You, you may be a guinea pig, but you're a very, very, very closely supervised one. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we keep an eye on your labs, yes, your blood, yes. your urine, way no. more than anybody else. Yes, it's nice that labs are done. They are monitoring everything, your kidney function. Symptoms. Your, yeah. Yes, symptoms. They are monitoring everything. And it, if anything happens, like, for instance, with IgA nephropathy, when you get sick, you can get blood in your urine. I don't know if that's happened to any of you guys, but it's happened to me a couple of times. And whenever that happens, Dr. Mandime is like on speed dial. I'm like, Dr. Mandime, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know? But immediately I go get my labs drawn um, to see what the kidney function is. Yes, it drops during that time, but then it always goes back up. So I'm very thankful that thankful for the close monitoring <laughs> there you go and again the our responsibility is safety as much as it is to make sure that the medicine works i mean it's yeah. otsuka's primarily responsibility on whether it works or not but i am interacting with jamila and other patients regularly so i see you all look into your eyes and i have to have a clear conscience saying this thing is safe this is the right thing for you and we need to continue or stop depending on how you're doing. And Absolutely. so the other thing is, we, I don't think you have ever felt pressure. If you have, please tell me. You can always stop the line. <laughs> you can always say, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. And it will not change anything. Any of your relationships with your Absolutely. doctors, with the PI, with anybody. So I'd like to reassure people listening that if you don't want to be part of the trial, you can always walk away. No harm, yeah. no fault. You don't have to be a part of it, but just think, you know, you're getting access to a new medication that is helping such a rare disease, you know. Um, this disease has, like, been around for, like, 50 years, so it's called, like, an orphan disease. It's just so strange, but, you know, you're getting access to something really good, you know, and there are a lot of new medications that are coming out. Um, for IgA nephropathy, which is, you know, amazing because 10 years ago, there was nothing. You would get on steroids. You would be on steroids daily. And then the long-term side effects of steroids, you know, like diabetes, high blood pressure, sometimes cataracts or glaucoma, osteoporosis. So all of those things with steroids. So I'm very, very thankful that I live in the time that I do um, to be able to have access to this medication. I mean, I cannot second that anymore because I've been a nephrologist almost 20 years now and only in the last three to five years have we, do we have the ability to take people like Jamila and bring her to a clinical trial unit and give her access to medicines. The guidelines that KDGO, which is our guideline-making organization for patients with IgA nephropathy, clearly has it in the center. All patients that have protein in their urine and a GFR that is greater than 30 should be eligible to participate in a trial. Only if they cannot participate in a trial should we try the other things, which is the steroids and several other medicines that have been around for many, many years. So this is front and center for IgA management. Um, I guess, Saira, if patients are out there and they want to find a trial, what would you, or how would you help tell them what to do? And Jamila, both of you can pitch in. If somebody's out there saying, hey, this is interesting, I want to find a trial, what advice? Mm -hmm. So, Sarah? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if you Call are me. in the Houston area, <laughs> yeah, we would love for you to come to um, our site here at Prolato. We're in the medical center. So, I mean, there's so many treatments out there it's for you to just to come in and see us. Um, we can we can go through the, there's something that is called inclusion exclusion, and we can go through that to see if you qualify, like Dr. Mandayam says, there is some sort of criteria for you to meet in order to join a trial. Um, 
in the Oksuka trial, the visionary that we're talking about today, um, really you only have to be 18 years or older um, and have a biopsy diagnosed with uh, IgA. And then we can go from there, simple as that. And then we can go through the whole process. So um, other than that, yes, please visit prolato.org where we're from. Or if you just want a general, um, go to clinicaltrials.gov. Yeah, oh. clinicaltrials.gov or talk to your physician. Um, talk to your nephrologist. Those are other ways to find out about clinical trials that are going on. But yeah, definitely clinicaltrials.gov and Prolato if you're in Houston. Yes. And and if if you're not if you're not near a clinical trial site, many 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 clinical trial sites will actually pay for travel for accommodation. We see patients from Oklahoma from all the way down to the valley and uh, to the border of Texas from Louisiana, and that's just our site. I am sure across the country, there are sites that will very happily pay for travel accommodation time spent. So distance should not be a barrier to participate in a trial. It, it's mostly, do you want to do it? And my recommendation is, if you have IgA nephropathy, you better be in a trial because that's your best opportunity to control this disease and hopefully not let it affect you. So any last words of advice or any advice for patients in IGA other than participate in a trial? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's it. I think that's it. Um, I think, you know, if your kidney function is good and uh, you still continue to have protein in your urine and it's not controlled with like lisinopril or losartan, then definitely get into a trial because that is what's going to slow or stop the progression of disease. That's the most important thing. And Saira, any last words on clinical trials and what do you think having done this for all these years? <laughs> I would say just come in, come talk to us. Uh, you know, come come get the information. It's free for you, it's out here. We're wanting to educate you and, and bring the best that's out there, um, especially for for these kind of diseases, rare, rare diseases, like you said. Um, so just just come in, there, there's no commitment. Just come get the information from us and let's start you know, a conversation about it. And I'm sure we can find some sort of treatment that would help you. Uh, it, it's really important that because what one of the big problems is most of the trials that are done that get the medicine approved are typically conducted on middle-aged white men. But most of the patients that have diseases are of various races. There are people that look like me, that look like Jamila, that look like Saira. How do we know a medicine works on you and me and not just the average middle-aged white men? So it's really important for all of us to be part of this process so that we can develop medicines that work for all of us. Um, I am going to take a pause now and see if there are any questions, if people have any comments or anything for us. Uh, okay, first question. Right, so the visionary trial is a phase three clinical trial and it's sponsored by Otsuka. So, uh, for clinical trials, before a medicine is actually swallowed or injected or touches a human being, science and FDA make sure that trials go through three big phases. Phase one is when they take normal human beings and administer the medicine to make sure it doesn't cause toxicity. Phase two is when they actually take patients with the disease and give different doses of the medicine to find the right dose that works best with the least side effects. And phase three is the big, the granddaddy of all trials, where um, a medicine is given to 300 to 500 patients across the world and is compared with standard of care to show that this medicine is definitely an addition to what is best that is available. So the visionary trial is a phase three clinical trial. So that means for sure it has gone through phases one and two. It has been safe and successful. Only then does the FDA allow a medicine to go into a phase three trial. So phase three trial of, of, of the visionary trial is a subcutaneous injection. So it's not even the IV infusion that Jamila has been getting. It's a sub -Q injection. It's once in four weeks. And it's typically between 52 to 104 weeks, about two years is how long we do the trial for. So patients are expected to come once a month uh, for the injection for a period of two years. And clinic visits when the injection is done is when we also 
measure blood test results, urine protein to monitor and make sure that you are safe and that you're not experiencing any side effects. And hopefully you're getting benefit from being on this medicine. So it would be a two year study and you come in once every month. And it's mostly for your safety. Uh, next question, do you wanna read this, Ara? Yes, it says, what happens during a clinical Perfect. trial visit? How long do they last and how does it compare to a routine doctor's visit? Um, so in a routine um, clinical visit that you come in, depending on what stage you're on, let's start from screening stage, especially for the Yoksuka study. We have two months to get all the information we need to assure that you are a great participant for this treatment. So we have that period of time where we get medical records, we do blood work, uh, we collect urine. Once we get all that information, then it's decided, do you qualify? Is this something good? Dr. Manayam and I sit down and look at the chart. And if we decide that, yes, this is a great participant for this treatment, then you go into what's called the treatment. Um, specifically for the visionary trial, there's 26 doses that you will come in. Now, that doesn't mean you will come in a little bit more. Like Jamila mentioned previously, there are those visits you get sick. Or, or you just don't feel well, You, I'm your coordinator, you call me and we will schedule you in on something that's called an unscheduled visit. And we would bring you in, do blood work um, and do the necessary, whatever Dr. Mandayan recommends that is needed, of course, a physical exam to see and make sure that all your levels are where they need to be. Like that, that's why we build such a bond because you're talking to us pretty, um, you know, on a daily basis sometimes, depending on what's happening. We are on it um, more than what, what your regular PCP would be. Oh, uh, question number three, what happens if I end up in the hospital or something happens to my health while I'm on a trial? Am I kicked out of the trial? Uh, not automatically, absolutely not. I think that, you know, part of life is you get sick and you may get end up in a hospital. What usually happens when you end up in a hospital is hopefully the doctor that's taking care of you in the hospital calls me and says, hey, your patient in the trial got sick and is in the hospital. What information would you like? Um, sometimes that doesn't happen and you call me and tell me, hey, doc, I'm in the hospital and I call your doctor and find out what's happening. As part of the FDA regulations for a clinical trial, whenever a patient ends up in a hospital, we have to gather all of that information on why and what treatment was given and what changed in the health status of the patient and submit it to the sponsor and the FDA. So we keep track of that. It isn't automatic that you would get kicked out of the trial just because you ended up in the hospital. The hope is that you don't and that everything we're doing is to keep you away from getting worsening health or ending up in a hospital. But for sure, that doesn't automatically kick you out. In fact, if that does happen and it's called a serious adverse event, it's a pretty rare thing and we want to know about it and we want to make sure that the trial was not responsible for that by any stretch of imagination. Wonderful question. Um, one thing we, sorry, there's, oh. I have one last question that we did not talk about, which is the cost. So Jamila spoke about a stipend, but I just wanted to emphasize again that there is, there is no cost yeah. to the patient to participate in a trial. So it's, uh, it is fully free to you, but it's really not free for us because we we thank you for taking the time, energy, and effort to contribute to the advancement of science. So it's sort of free for you. You actually get reimbursed for being in the trial, but it's a huge plus for science and for physicians like me that can provide these medicines for other people. Oh, before we wind up, there is a question from for, YouTube. For Jamila. Jamila. Yeah. Jamila, if you can chime in, it says, what side effects was were you talking about that you were concerned about from the other trial that you were looking at? So when you considered an oral versus an injectable? Yeah, it was um, lymphedema or swelling <clears throat> that could happen in the um, legs. Um, you could gain weight, like you could gain weight from the lymphedema. It could potentially cause like uh, problems breathing because of the fluid. Um, and so I didn't want to take any chances with that. So that's why I decided that I would not do the oral and go with the injection. And as the PI, my responsibility is to make sure that Jamila is comfortable with her choice. Mm -hmm. I am not 
ever officially allowed, officially or unofficially allowed, to steer her or force her to make a decision one way or the other. It is 100% voluntary and it's informed. So she decides what she wants to do and we respect her decisions. Exactly. Uh, are there any other questions? So I just want to take this moment to thank all of you and the NKF Patient Network. Um, it's wonderful that this network exists to help improve the lives of patients with kidney disease through research, care, and development, and also helps support policy decisions. Uh, please go to this website, learn more, register. It's nkfpatientnetwork.org. This is for all of us, for patients like you, for physicians like me, for clinical research coordinators like Saira. You never know who's going to get IgA nephropathy because it may be you next week, next month. It may be anybody we know in our family or friends. So kidney disease is not as rare as we all want to pretend and believe it is. And I'm so happy that we're able to provide trials and treatments for patients with IgA nephropathy. Last word, Saira, Jamila, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, just if you have, if you live in the Houston area, we would have, be happy to have you here at Prolato. And again, I just wanted to say Otsuka is sponsoring the visionary clinical trial, which is a phase three study of sibiprenlimab in IgA nephropathy. And it's wonderful to have patients participate and be able to experience the benefits of this drug. Jamila, up to you. <laughs> um, I just want to say that thank you for allowing me to kind of um, give my experience, you know, because I know that although the disease is rare, there are people out there that are looking for medication, new medication. And so this is a wonderful opportunity for us to kind of spread awareness. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah.